Well, thank you. Thank you so much for the organizers for having me, and thank you for that uh, wonderful introduction. I'm, sure, I'm not sure it's entirely true, especially the last part, but, but uh, we'll, just, we'll just go with that. So um, for the next, uh, actually, let me take a step back. So Justin, I believe, asked me to think about what might be the future of a psychiatric lab like. And I'm glad I looked at the brochure now just uh, five minutes ago to realize that that's the actual question. And uh, if I had to give my two cents on this, I think I would say that in the future, I would, see, I would like to see the psychiatric lab being less and less an actual physical lab and physical space. I think what I would like to move towards personally is a situation where the phenotyping and the interventions are increasingly done there in the wild. And, uh, and I think that smartphones offer uh, a reasonable opportunity for us to, uh, to do this. So what is the problem that we're trying to solve? So we and many others refer to this as the uh, phenotyping challenge. And many people in the past 20 years have talked about the idea of doing large-scale phenotyping or phenomics as a way to make progress in the biomedical sciences. And this is often done as something that would be complementary to genome sequencing. Now, if we think about all the different types of, different categories of phenotypes, behavior has traditionally been a very difficult phenotype because of the context dependence and the temporal dependence. So we traditionally haven't had a very good handle on, on behavior. So this is the problem that we're trying to, uh, um, trying to contribute in, in some way. So I think our conclusion was, actually quite a few years ago, that what we need is a scalable way to measure social and behavioral markers objectively in the wild. We started this type of work about 12 years ago and first published on this 10 years ago. Of course, nobody really had smartphones in, in those days. So we used very simple call data to look at things like large-scale social network structure and look at mobility patterns of, of, of individuals. But something happened in the past 10 years, which is that now we all have these, these devices and they've become increasingly sophisticated. And it feels like we, our everyday life relies on these, these devices. Our calendars are on these, on these gadgets and so on. So our proposed solution is the ubiquity and capability of smartphones to collect objective social and behavioral data might be a way to contribute to this phenotyping problem. And so as part of our work in this area, we've defined digital phenotyping in the following sense. Um, uh, it is the moment-by-moment -moment quantification of the individual level human phenotype in situ, in the wild, using data from personal digital devices, in particular smartphones. And, and a couple of people have talked about uh, precision medicine. And one thing I'd like to make, one point I'd like to make here is that I think it's important to give precise definitions. If we are to take precision medicine seriously, I think the first thing we need to do is to think about definitions for the concepts that, that uh, we use. And we, of course, keep modifying the definitions as we learn more and more. And so why do I think that digital phenotyping would have some advantages, in particular smartphone-based digital phenotyping? And from my perspective, this can be categorized by three uh, simple arguments. One is so many people have these devices, so we can have studies that have a very large end, a large number of subjects. The second point is that, especially if we rely on passive data, we can do very long-term studies. So at McLean with Justin and others, we have an ongoing study where we've been collecting passive data, I believe, for 16 months. So that's the second point. We can do, not, we can, not only can we uh, have many people in our studies, but we can follow them up for a very long time, potentially multiple years. And the third point, I think, is very important and often overlooked. So the way our health system, our medical system works today is that something happens to you and that's the point in time where data collection happens. So we can think about the PTSD example. At that point, the assault has already happened. We don't know very much about these people uh, um, uh, before. And so we're also uh, participating in the Aura study, which is where this example comes from. So the nice thing about this approach is that we can think about a study where we have not only post data, but also pre-data, the data that, that is collected before um, something happens to a particular person. So these are the key reasons why I think that this is a potentially helpful approach. So we started our digital phenotyping project in, in, in 2013. I'm eternally grateful for the NIH for funding this from their new innovator portfolio. And uh, we had two goals in this project. Our first goal was to develop a customizable, scalable, open research platform for high-throughput smartphone-based digital phenotyping. 
And this is work that we've now completed, and in the next few weeks' time, we're looking at making an open source release of this software, so anybody and everybody could then, well, anybody could uh, use this platform for their own studies. Our current attention has now shifted from building the platform, although we still do work in this area. We're now more focused on building statistical methods, and by that I mean that can incorporate machine learning and more traditional methods for taking the data and making sense of the data. And I've made this point, I think, for some time now that it's not easy to collect research-grade data, but it's getting easier. I think where the real intellectual bottleneck is right now is trying to make sense of, say, one billion points of data collected from each patient every single month. And a lot of people are talking about uh, big data in this context, but I actually think that a more descriptive term is noisy data. And these are huge data sets, but even, even huger, is, if that's a word, is the amount of noise in these, in these data. And this is an aspect that often is overlooked, but if you look at the actual raw data, you will quickly come to the conclusion that these data are pretty, pretty noisy. So what is our goal in this area? Our goal is to try to systematize data collection and data analysis in smartphone-based digital phenotyping. In this type of work, we talk about two different kinds of data, like almost everybody. We divide data into active and passive data. So active data is things like surveys and audio samples, data that are only collected if the person actually actively does something. Then in passive data, we have actually two different categories. We have sensor data, like GPS, and then we have phone usage logs, like communication logs, screen on-off logs, and so on. And currently, the, the BW platform uh, is used, I believe, in 15 different uh, studies across uh, Harvard Medical School teaching hospitals. So a common question uh, is, what's, what, what's BWI? And how do you pronounce that? Well, we pronounce it BWI, so I think you should also pronounce it BWI. <laughs> but BWI is actually the name of a Nordic goddess of sunlight and mental health. And uh, she was around about 5,000 years ago. I don't know if she's still around, but, but this is, the, this is where, the, uh, where the name comes from. So how does, this, how does this idea work? So um, we really tried to make this transparent and scalable from the, from the beginning because we are getting about a 1 billion data points per subject per, per month. And it's important to understand that it's not an app, it's a research platform. And there are two pieces or components to this. It's the front end and the back end. The front end consists of Android and iOS applications that run on people's smartphones. And essentially what all they do is they try to pull in as much passive data as possible and do some surveys and so on. The more exciting part to us is the backend system, which has four components to it. So one is the uh, web interface. We can now set up a study in, in about five minutes, or my RA can, can do that that fast. The idea is everything is customizable, because every single study has its own scientific questions, and therefore has its own specific data collection needs. So data collection across all sensors is completely customizable. Then we uh, do the data collection. We run EC2 instances on AWS. So AWS is the Amazon Web Services. And the idea there is that, wh why run this on cloud? So, so the idea is that this would be a completely fully scalable system. So as you have more and more people in your study, the system will automatically spin up new servers as needed. And we wanted to build this to a point where we could have a study with one million subjects. We don't have any study that big. Our biggest study is probably 250 people. So we still have a little bit of way to go to one million. But this is how we've tried to, uh, to uh, build this up. We use uh, Amazon also for data storage, and the most important piece of the back end, back end from our point of view is the data analysis pipeline. So this is where we really try to take these noisy billions of points of data and turn them, in, turn them into something uh, meaningful. Some people, actually many people have talked about interventions, so I wanted to make this uh, point, this distinction about phenotyping and thinking about interventions. So from my point of view, it's possible to do the phenotyping piece using a single platform. We have about 12, 13, or 16 different data streams coming from the smartphone, depending on how you want to count them, but it's conceivable that you would have one platform that pulls in all that data and tries to make sense of the data. But I don't think it's conceivable, conceivable to have one single platform that, that carries out all kinds, of, all kinds of interventions you can think of. So the idea is that we are, when we provide BWI openly to the community, 
community, then we will, uh, we will have uh, at least tried to address the data collection piece. Then others can build intervention pieces on top of that. So they will have all the work that we've been doing for the past uh, few years to build that platform. I got scooped on this slide, so this is, uh, I'll just show the basic idea that when we want to set up a study, we, uh, we uh, uh, go to the study portal, which is a web page, we customize the study settings, um, um, participants are given user IDs and temporary passwords, they log into, they go to iTunes or somewhere, they download the app, and once they put in their name and password, they're automatically connected with the right study, so they have the right data collection settings, right surveys, and, and so on. Now I want to say a little bit more about reproducibility uh, in just one, one second. This is a partial list, not a complete list of some of the data that we're currently collecting. So we can do, on the active data side, we can do surveys, we can survey metadata also, which is very helpful so you can learn about how long does it take for a person to complete the survey and, and so on. We can also do audio voice recording. So for example, it's a lot of evidence that you can find vocal markers of depression in, in audio. And this could be something that going back to Matt's talk could also be uh, very helpful. We're also doing some uh, simple cognitive tests which are under development with, with John Torres. On the passive data side, we collect essentially everything you can, GPS, accelerometer, um, um, communication logs, and, and so on. A lot of these have actually unobvious use cases. So if I had more time, I would talk about that, but maybe we'll save that for questions. So this is a, a view of the back end. So this is a view of the, you know, you use the, the, uh, the uses in your browser. That's how you access the, the back end. And this is a screenshot of what it looks like when you are setting up a study. So let's say you were interested in a study where you collect GPS data. So you would just click the GPS thing here. And then you have to customize the data sampling uh, scheme for GPS. So sampling alternates between an on cycle and off cycle. When it's in the on cycle, the sensor is collecting data. When it's in the off cycle, it's sleeping. So it keeps going back and forth between these two cycles. So here, you get to specify the length of those two cycles in seconds. So again, depending on what type of data you're interested in collecting, you can just customize that from, um, from this panel. This is data for, uh, for my, my previous RA, and, uh, and I've used this slide many times before, and she has told me multiple times, so she doesn't mind if I, if I show this slide. So in this case, working with Ian Barnett, who was one of the speakers earlier today, who's my previous postdoc, we worked on this idea of trying to, uh, essentially collecting GPS data and filling missing gaps and so on. That's a more technical topic, but I just want to give you the intuition about why GPS data might be valuable. So we take GPS data, Ian does all kinds of tricks with the data, and ultimately we turn it into what are called flights and pauses. Flights are, are a single, you're essentially points in time when you're moving in one direction to constant velocity, and pauses are exactly what it sounds like. You're, you're paused, you, you don't move. And this is the location of my RA's home. This is location of work. We've also color coded these. So the lines are flights, the circles are pauses. The bigger the circle, the bigger the pause, and so on. So for example here, this is her home. I know that she has a dog. You can't tell that from GPS. But she does have a dog. So she takes her dog on a walk in the morning. Then she comes to work. And around noon or so, she goes out somewhere, presumably to have coffee or, or lunch. So this is data from Monday, this is data from Tuesday. We can look at the same data for Saturday and Sunday. Now the point here is that this is a tool for, for spying on your uh, doc students or, 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 or RAs, but, or in order to make trivial conclusions that, oh, wow, people behave differently on Saturdays than Tuesdays. But if we think about somebody who might be bipolar, for example, you know, this might be a, this might be a typical trajectory for someone when they're depressed. Or perhaps when somebody is becoming suicidal, it might be possible to, to see this. We also have a couple of studies at the Brigham here, which is just a couple of blocks away, involving patients with spine tumors and brain tumors. So here the intuition would be that before surgery, uh, it would be unlikely to see a person move around too far from their home if they have a, 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 a spine tumor. But once they get better, their mobility would increase. And we actually have evidence for this. This is a partial list of some of the different uh, uh, summary statistics we can construct from the, from the data. One thing I didn't mention yet earlier is that 
it's really imperative to collect raw data from these sensors. And I'll come back to this point very briefly. It's critical. It makes our work at least 100 times more difficult, but this is a very important point for several reasons. We can uh, discuss that further. So here is from one study, this is not actually a mental health study, but this is data for one patient in this particular in our cancer study. So this is a, the kind of data summary that Ian Barnett already showed. So the different rows correspond to different uh, days, I'm sorry, the different rows correspond to different summary statistics, and the different columns correspond to different days. So then we can take the data, say all the data we get from GPS, here only again a partial list, which are showing in blue, and we can ask things like how much time do you spend at home and so on. We can take the GPS, we can take the accelerometer data, and we can count the number of steps that people take and so on. So this really gives you a pretty rich uh, view of, of what's happening. I alluded to the uh, spine surgery study before, and a couple of people today made the point that sometimes we really do have to use uh, active data. I, I just see uh, Justin stop sign, but this is Boston, so here it really doesn't mean very much, but I will, I will, I will wrap up very, very shortly. Uh, zero tickets so far and nine years in the going, so. This is, uh, so these are uh, 150 people who have a spine tumor. We're looking at data for a single patient here. And something like pain, it's a, an obviously a very highly subjective experience. So what we did in this case, we have a single point of intervention here. So on the x-axis, we have the timeline. So it's about 19 or 20 weeks of data. The red line here tells you the date of surgery. This is when the tumor was removed from that person's spine. If you look at the black dots, they give you the level of pain. So every day we do just one question. What is the level of pain you're experiencing today? 10 is the worst possible pain. Zero is no pain at all. And the y-axis is here on the left. And what you see, they have considerable pain, considerable levels of pain. And then that goes down to maybe about two. And then you see one thing that happens. And we will be seeing this in more and more studies. Once the person gets better, they stop taking the surveys but we continue to collect the passive data. So what's shown in the purple curve here is the probability for that person on any given day to move more than one kilometer. So you can see that as the uh, level of pain for this person goes down, their mobility, probability to move goes up. And this is something, of course, that we would expect. The purple curve, we can get at zero cost to anyone, but of course the, uh, the pain scores we can only obtain by doing surveys. Justin, do you have two more minutes? All right. One of the uh, points that I think uh, has been made a couple of times, but I think this is a really critical point. This is nothing, nothing fancy, but it's really, really crucial. This is one of my uh, uh, favorite papers, one, one of my favorite reports, and it cites a, a study that came out in 2011. And this is, everybody should read this report and the underlying study. So, this deals with reproducibility of biomedical research. And the really depressing figure is that only 6% of studies, medical studies, are completely reproducible. Now one can debate what does it mean for a study to be completely reproducible and so on, but clearly the numbers are extremely slow. So in order for us to, so, our, so how, do we, how do we try to address this problem? So in BWI, we introduced the simple idea of a configuration file. So every study generates a single configuration file that has all the survey, surveys in it, survey timings, uh, passive data collection settings, everything is captured in that one configuration file. And you can export and import these files. So the idea is that if I do a study this year and Matt wants to replicate the study next year, he just has to import with a single click that file and you have identical data collection. So this is our, um, two cents towards trying to address this problem. Do we really need another app or, or research platform? And there are many reasons why I think this is, this is really important. In particular, we did not want to rely on proprietary summary statistics. This is because if you're using um, uh, some of the, you know, like what Apple, for example, provides, they may change the definition of the summary statistics on the fly. When you do a long study, a consequence is that is that the metrics are changing in time. And that's really quite problematic. Then there are many other arguments that could be made. I want to just take, talk about one more point here. So 
a lot of the time, we don't necessarily know at the beginning of a study what is it exactly that we want to capture. So let's say that we wanted to, we start, decided that we're going to be counting the number of steps a person takes. And then it turns out that this person develops Parkinson's disease in the course of this two year long study. If we were counting the number of steps and we see tremors, we would actually have no data because presumably these don't count as steps. However, if we have the raw accelerometer data, we can go back in time, we can find the call logs, the points in time when the person is talking on the phone, and we can use the accelerometer data to estimate the frequency and amplitude of these tremors. So the point is we don't always know ahead of time what is it that we want to look at. I'll conclude here this one final slide I, I promised Justin. Um, a lot of people are very excited about AI, and I'm very excited about, the, about AI. I created our deep learning course, so I love deep learning as, as much as anybody else here. But it's also important to understand that we don't really understand the limitations of deep learning, AI, and nobody really has any idea about strong eye, which is artificial, artificial general intelligence. This is a paper that came out two weeks ago. And it's one of these uh, papers that try to fool a classifier. So you're trying to teach a deep learning classifier to tell an airplane from a dog, from a cat, and so on. And what they did was they take existing pictures and they, they just modify a single pixel in these images. So you can, see these, you can see these green dots that the researchers added here in these pictures. And what happens as a consequence? Well, for example, this thing here is actually an airplane. But if you add a single dot, the AI system thinks it's a dog. Here, this is actually a cat. You add the single green dot, it becomes a dog. This is a frog, but there's one, one dot here, and it thinks it's a truck, and so on. So this is, again, I love deep learning and, 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 and so on, but I think it's really important to be aware of the limitations of, of these systems. And I don't think at this point in time we really have a, a complete understanding of these. I will leave the most important slide of this talk here and I will wrap it up here. Thank you very much.